Have you thought about life after lockdown? Can you picture it? Picture it when you're finally able to, to go to that person and, and not just look through the window, not just speak to them across the wall, but to see that person again, to be with that person again. Maybe it's to think of that, just that thought of, of just holding, of, of hugging someone again. Maybe you're just longing to get out. Maybe you're just, you're desperate to see out of these walls and, and out of this little spot and to, to go out and to go and meet with people and go gather with a crowd again and, and do the things that you love to do. Have you thought about life after lockdown? I wonder, have you thought, is there anything going to change? Couples, families, friends, are you going to change? Maybe, maybe are you going to pray together? Maybe you've started praying together as a husband and a wife now, or, or maybe you've started praying together as a family, or, or even in a little WhatsApp group with friends. Have you felt an encouragement in that and thought, why weren't we doing this before? Can we continue to pray together? Maybe it's a smaller change, but it's, it's just a change of staying in contact with people. There's people who've been meant so much to you over these last few weeks, and you think, well, well we're definitely going to stay in contact. And, Maybe it's that missing of people. It just makes you ache and yearn to enjoy people again. You know, one of the big questions from COVID-19 is about our country. Is, is our country going to change? Will we be closer to our neighbours after this because we've, we've missed seeing people and speaking to people? Or are we going to be further away? Are we going to be less reliant on technology because we realise that just seeing people through a video screen, there's something missing about that? Or are we going to become more reliant on technology? Will we be more health conscious as a country or will we be less health conscious as a country? You know, the time that we're going through is a, is a time that is going to be written in the history books. For years to come, That this period is going to be the centre of government study, of academic study, of scientific study. It's going to be a source for art and for inspiration. But this morning, I, I want us to see a bigger change. Bigger than that change of the announcement when the government finally says that isolation is ended and that lockdown is over. A change that is equally historical. That is something which history books have been written about. Which is a, a change which has taken place, which is bigger than the changes we're going through now. It's a change for all of history. A change for our country. A change for your life. The change of the resurrection that Jesus is alive. Now, I know it feels strange this morning not being in our church services, but there's some surprising similarities. Surprising similarities to that first Easter Sunday morning when the, the churches then too were empty, the disciples were in lockdown, that there was a, a state of fear, a state of despair hanging over the church. And then there comes into that despair this message of restoration, this message of life and of joy and of Jesus risen from the dead. And so I hope and pray that as we consider our own lives, as we consider this message of the resurrection, that we will see in Jesus a hope and a joy to lift us from fear and to lead us together to stand boldly in the name of Jesus Christ. We're just going to work our way through that passage, starting in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 57. My first point with the resurrection is prepare in despair. Prepare in despair. You know, sometimes we group people into, well, that person's an optimist and this person, they're a pessimist. But, you know, as I've been thinking about it, lots of us, it's not that we're always optimistic or always pessimistic. But it's about particular things, that, that whether it's our personality or with our experience or our giftings, we'll, we'll look at some things with a very negative perspective and we'll, we'll see other things with a very positive perspective. So let me take an example. So, so perhaps you're driving along the road and you hear a sudden noise from your car engine. Now to me, that would fill me with despair. Oh no, what's this going to be? What's this going to take to fix? How are we going to get this sorted? How am I going to live without a car for any length of time? Maybe for somebody else in the church, but it's, it's actually a challenge. It's an, an excitement. Oh, I'm going to get to the bottom. What, what is making that noise? How am I going to fix this? Maybe what is this an opportunity for, for an upgrade, for an improvement to make my car even better? Maybe it's you're going out for a walk. 
and there's two people walking along and, and one of them looks and they see the vast beauty but the other one just sees the danger of the cliff edge. Whether it's we doubt different things or fear different things or are excited by different things, well, it all depends on your perspective. And so here as we come in verse 57, we come to the very end of Good Friday where we read there about Joseph of Arimathea coming and taking Jesus' body. And then the next day, Easter Saturday, we read about the chief priests and the Pharisees going before Pilate. And what I noticed is that all of them are pessimists, but in different ways. So the disciples, they were all in a state of shock. They had absolutely no thought about Jesus' promises. They had no thought about hope or what Jesus had said would happen. And of course, we can completely understand that. Despite the fact that Jesus had taught them so frequently and so clearly about his resurrection, that they have just been through one of the most horrendous experiences in history. All of their hopes, all of their dreams, all of their loves have been dashed in a brutal day of horror and all they're left with is mourning and sadness. The only people who on Easter Saturday who are remember Jesus' promise Verse 62, surprisingly, it's, it's his enemies. It's Jesus' enemies that are preparing for the worst for them, for, for the possibility that, that perhaps this promise of Jesus could come true. And so they, they set a guard that they try and prepare themselves for the worst can happen. Which is, as we see something of our situation in that first Easter morning, as we picture those disciples locked in in fear, you know, we have to ask ourselves, Are we prepared in despair? Do we see only the negative? Is all that we can see today in our lives the hard things, the painful things, the problems? Maybe even spiritually speaking, is all that you can see your doubts? That you can just see all the the problems? I know it's so often a reality for us in weakness. When our bodies are weak, our minds follow the same course. And the devil is very quick to use any opportunity to come in and to attack. And perhaps all you can see in this time of difficulty in your life and in our country is the black. It is that sense of fear and despair and darkness. Can I encourage you this morning? Prepare in despair. Look to the promises. You know, perhaps you've got many doubts. You're sceptical about Easter Sunday. You're sceptical about whether this day in your life can really make any difference. You feel like life's on hold. Why is today going to change anything? Maybe it's about the whole of Christianity. That you've got doubt you think Easter Sunday, that that simply is unbelievable. That simply couldn't be true. Can I encourage you to doubt your doubts? To apply that same scepticism that you're applying to the promises of God to do those other things that you're trusting in. Apply your doubts to your assumptions about why God couldn't do those things. Apply those doubts that you have about your life changing to doubt why should your life stay the same? Why can't things change today? Why can't God move and work in your life? Why couldn't you turn back to him? Why couldn't you come and walk with him and, and know a newness and a fullness of life? You see, the message of the resurrection is a message of the promise of Jesus Christ. It's a message of hope. It's a message of life. And it's a call for us that that even in days of darkness, when, when all we can see is fear and pain and anxiety, that there is hope together in Jesus' name. That there is hope in that promise of the gospel. There's hope for you in Jesus Christ. Prepare. Look to the promises that even despair we can turn and see a saviour who has risen from the dead. First of all, the resurrection. Prepare in despair. Secondly, the resurrection. News that changes everything. Picking up in chapter 28 and verse 1. Matthew's focus here is particularly on the announcement, first of all. Now, now, again, we can perhaps think of the announcements that have been made around our country in this last month. And one of the things that struck me has been simply the, the very repetitive and the clearness 
as the government and the Queen and celebrities and sports people that they've been lining up to get behind this one message. That anybody who's deviated from that message has been instantly apologising and stepping down from their position. That they're all trying to get the message out. Well, that's Matthew's focus. First of all, his focus is on the announcement of the resurrection. Verse 2, the Marys are coming to the tomb and there is this great earthquake. Verse 3, then, then this angel appears and his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. That This is a ground-shaking, world-changing, heaven-opening announcement. Verse 5 and 6, the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. That's the announcement that changes the world. The angel's announcement is so important because the angel is proclaiming that that this is the completion of redemption. That Jesus' work of cross work and Jesus' resurrection, that they fit together. You can't have one without the other. It's only by Jesus dying for our sins and then rising on the third day that death could truly be defeated, that redemption could be won, that there could be life for God's people and and hope for us for salvation. Paul writes that if Jesus was not raised, then you are still dead in your sins. It's the resurrection that brings life to the world. This is our hope. Redemption has been completed. Jesus has done everything that was required. So so now that there is for us life and power and salvation in the name of Jesus, we're not living anymore under the, the period of sin or under the power of sin or the curse of sin. But Jesus has risen. We're living in this time of COVID-19. But this is our hope. He has risen. Yes, it is a time of fear. It's a time of loss. It's a time of shock for our country. But the resurrection gives us a hope. A hope that goes beyond the things of this world. A hope that lifts us. A hope that sustains us. That, That resurrection of Jesus is living in us too. That we too have his power, have his spirit, have his life living inside of us. And so we're not chained by death and despair. We're alive in Jesus Christ. Now these women who came to the tomb, their immediate reaction, of course, is is one of shock. From whiplash, from from going from that despair to to suddenly these, these conflicted emotions. I love the way verse 8 describes it. So they quickly departed from the tomb with fear and with great joy. Isn't that a beautiful picture for us on Easter Sunday? Fear and great joy. Paul again, right in Corinthians, he describes the church as sorrowful, but always rejoicing. That if you're listening this morning and you are going through a time of fear, a time of pain and of difficulty, we're not denying the reality of that. But even in our pains and fears and worries, the resurrection brings us a message of joy and rejoicing. That we as a church, even as we do know that sadness and sorrow of mourning with people, we also have that sustaining power and that life of Jesus Christ raising up inside us, giving us hope, giving us joy, giving us delight in him. We have an announcement to make, an announcement to tell. The gospel is not under lockdown. I can tell you with absolute confidence that this week in Northern Ireland, people are being saved. People are coming to Jesus Christ. Evangelism is not under lockdown. That This is a time for the good news of the gospel to go forward. What we think of those who are on that front line, and as maybe you're there at this time, you're, you're coming alongside people going through real worries and fears in their life. And as you minister and serve alongside them, you have a hope. You have a hope that you can share. A powerful love of Jesus Christ, which which means that we face every problem, not in a blasé fashion, but with a confidence that we have Jesus Christ in us and that we can love and care and give. 
knowing him with us. Uh, maybe you're not out. Maybe you're in lockdown at the minute in the house by yourself. Well, if you're on the internet, as I know many of you are following me this morning on the internet, well, well, what can you use your internet page for? Can you share posts? Can, can you have an online witness to other people to tell them the hope and the good news of Jesus? Why don't you go and look for your favourite hymn on YouTube and, and like it or put some message on Facebook about what it means to you. Share some of the little clips that we're doing of our Hope in the Darkness series or maybe some of our Stump the Preacher big questions. It's a chance for us to, to share with others this hope of the gospel with a CD or a DVD. Perhaps there's someone who, who comes to visit you or brings your groceries. Could you pass that on to them? To just find some small ways of sharing our hope in Jesus. As we're so aware of losing our normal relationships that we rely on. Isn't this a chance to connect with others? Are there people who you've lost touch with that you never meant to? That you wish you could connect with them again? Isn't this a perfect time? Evangelism is not under lockdown. The gospel is not under lockdown. This is a time for us as a church to be looking for others, to be reaching out, to be speaking to people. This is the announcement that changes the world. This is the news of salvation, that we don't have to live in a world under the rule of death and despair and hopelessness. But this morning, you, if you don't know Jesus as Saviour, this announcement is for you. Jesus has risen. And whatever other hopes you have in life, whatever else it is that you're looking forward to or that you excites you, this is a hope that can truly last. This is the only hope that can get past that barrier of death and, and break it down. This is the only hope that we can turn and we can trust, not just in the Saviour who died, but the Saviour who lives. And by his resurrection power, he can break the things that are holding you in your life. He can break the things which are restraining you and taking you away from him. He can give you the power to live for him in fullness and reality and in joy. Come to Jesus. Come and ask him to be your saviour, to know the power of that resurrection. First of all, the resurrection. Prepare in despair. Turn to the promises. Secondly, the resurrection, it's news that changes everything. Thirdly and finally, the resurrection, it's the meeting that restores. Verse 8 and 9, we then come to this meeting. As we're picturing at the start, picture that day of that announcement when the government ends, that these restrictions can be lifted, that it's safe for us to meet people again. Can you picture that meeting? Can you picture grandparents? getting to hug their grandchild. Maybe picture boyfriend and girlfriend who haven't been able to see each other and now they're finally able to come together again and to, to see each other and to hold each other's hand. Maybe you can picture just, just valuing people and seeing people you've missed and enjoying that bustle and that buzz of the group and the crowd and all your friends gathered together. Maybe, maybe we'll miss after that government announcement. But after that announcement, it's easy for us to miss, to miss the reality of what happens next in verse 9. There's the great announcement of the angel. That's the government announcement. But then verse 9, we read that as they ran to tell the disciples, and behold, Jesus met them. That the angelic message was the earth-shattering announcement for all the world that Jesus is alive. But now we come to meet with Jesus. And that's what church is. Church is not a show. Church is not just some emotional high. Church is meeting Jesus through his promised means, through prayer and the word. It's an opportunity. It's a calling for us to meet the risen Jesus Christ. It's what we can know every day. Not through whipping ourselves up into an emotional frenzy, but through reading his word, turning to him in prayer. Maybe you do know that sense of isolation, but that sense of loneliness. Can you turn to meet with Jesus this morning? 
to turn. And I like these women who come here, they come and they take hold of his feet and they worship him. Again, I think Matthew means to give us is this, this sharp picture that the resurrection leads us to worship. To worship that Jesus is now proclaimed for all the world that he is God. And so we come to him this morning and and if you want to meet with Jesus, you have to come with that heart of worship. To worship him as the risen Lord, to worship him as your God, the one in whom you delight in, the one who deserves all our worship and all of our praise. But not only that, but the resurrection also is the place of restored relationships. Verse 10 Jesus speaks to the woman and he says to them, first of all, greetings. That's just a hello. He speaks to them as a, as a friend. And then he says to them, verse 10, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. You see, the resurrection, it led to the end of isolation and meeting with Jesus, which led to worship which leads to relationship. That This is the first time in the Bible where Jesus refers to his disciples as his brothers. That now after the cross and resurrection, Jesus is opening up the family of God. That we, through his death, through his salvation, can come and become members of his family, to become part of of his family circle, called sons and daughters of the king. Think of the disciples. Who is it that Jesus is sending this message to? It's the people who abandoned him. It's the people who were afraid, who ran away. The people who aren't there waiting for him on the third day when he told them to be ready for him. But out of all of their failures, they're invited to become family. They're invited to come and know him as their brother. The resurrection proclaims a restoration that we can come and know Jesus truly. Maybe at some point in your life, you were really living and following Jesus with all of your heart, but you've gone far away from that. It's grown cold. Do you know just that pain? Maybe you fear you're going to fail again. Maybe you think it could never be real. Come and meet with Jesus. From He takes people from their point of failure and restores them to his family. That you can be part of the family of God. In the resurrection, we meet with Jesus. Beyond of life's circumstances, beyond all that we go through in this world, when we look to the resurrection, we see him as the living God. And just as certainly as the woman met Jesus on the road to the disciples, One day you will meet with Jesus. One day we will all stand before the risen Lord as judge of all the earth. And so this is the resurrection. The resurrection is news. Prepare to meet Jesus. Whatever else you may be facing, whatever else sorrow, whatever other troubles we may go through, we need to prepare ourselves. Hear his promise. We need to hear that news, the news that changes everything. The tomb was empty. Jesus is alive and we need to be ready to meet with him. Will you answer that invitation? Will you hear his call on you to come and be part of his family through the cross, to meet him and know him and to receive his blessing? Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for that good news of Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is the way, the truth and the life. And Father, we thank you that that empty tomb means there is hope for us in this world of sorrow and death, that we can know him as our brother. We pray and ask that, Father, we would know the reality of meeting with him through our despairs, by his promise, in his word. And that, Father, you would turn our hearts, turn our hearts in this Easter morning to the resurrection, to the joy of his life, to the good news of his message, and to that grace, mercy and peace. And there the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit be within each and every one of us, now and forevermore. Amen. Let's let's pray one more time, singing the Getty hymn, Beneath the Cross of Jesus, I Find a Place to Stand.